Good morning, church. After careful prayer and consideration, the elders and Pastor Kwam decided that it would be prudent that we worship the Lord via electronic format for just these next two weeks. It's a gift to be able to meet this way. Of course, we look forward to being back together in person soon. In the meantime, God can use his word this way as well, and for that, we are very thankful. It's also a gift that in the midst of a world full of things that give us anxiety and worry and fear, that we have the very creator of the universe, the author and perfecter of our lives, our days, our faith, who's sovereign over all things. His grace is ever sufficient. He knows what we need before we even ask and promises to be with us. And because of that, things are okay. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together as your church, to look at your word, to be changed by it, to grow together, and to hear what you would have us hear. So Lord, today I pray for those who are suffering or sick or ill. Lord, grant them what they need. Give them peace and comfort and healing according to your will. And Lord, we pray that you will prepare our hearts and our minds to receive what you would have us receive today. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Several weeks ago in Sunday school, we covered the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with the kids. It's a familiar story for a lot of us. It's a long time been one of my favorites. I can't remember a time in my life when I didn't actually know this story about God's deliverance and how he works miracles. But maybe you're like me and you've known this story for a long time. Perhaps it's new to you. Uh, either way, let's get some background on it together. Uh, God's people, due to their sin and unrepentance, have been carried away to exile by the Babylonians. Uh, we know from the Bible this is not the first time nor the last time in their history where this has happened. These people, these people knew struggle. Their homeland had been ransacked, their houses looted and burned, their temple destroyed. All that they knew and loved was taken from them, and they were now captives in a foreign land. There's so much rich history and truth and background to the story that we won't cover in a brief time together this morning, but I encourage you to read it. And we're going to look at some of these key verses together here today. I encourage you to grab your Bible. Uh, you probably have one sitting nearby because you're probably at your kitchen table or maybe in your recliner. Uh, you might want to grab something to highlight with too. There are some really good passages that will be worth underlining in our study together today. Daniel chapter 1 is where we start. So Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 in the Old Testament uh, says this, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, <clears throat> came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put the treasure, put it in the treasure house of his God. It goes on to say that they also took the best of the best, the young men who were uh, the cream of the crop, and started training them for service to the king of Babylon. Verse 5, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. This was the best of the best. And they were to be trained for three years. And after that, they would enter the king's service. Verse 6, among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief officials gave them new names the names that we recognize, uh, to Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Michelle, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. The text goes on to tell a story of how Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego didn't want, frankly, the junk food that the king was serving. They asked to be served vegetables. Uh, <laughs> maybe there's a lesson here for us too in what we eat, though not the point of this message. They asked to eat vegetables and they were much healthier because of it. Daniel 1 verse 16 tells us that all the young men who were in training then ate the diet that these four did because they did so much better than the rest of them. Verse 17 tells us that these young men were granted great wisdom and knowledge and that Daniel, by God's wisdom and grace, could even understand dreams. Verse 9, the king talked to them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Daniel chapter 2, if you flip over there in your Bible, is a fascinating story. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, uh, more of a nightmare really, and he wants someone, he needs someone to tell him what it means. There's a lot of back and forth, there's numerous death threats, peril, excitement. Bottom line, Daniel appears before the king, gives the one true God all the glory and praise, and then he tells the king what his dream meant. The king is relieved and thankful. 
Daniel chapter 2, verse 47. Let's pick it up there. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries. For you are able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Note verse 49. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. This gets us to our text today, Daniel chapter 3, and verse 1 starts this way. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 feet wide, and he set, about, set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. How quickly we forget, how quickly the king forgot. His declaration of God, of being the God of gods and the Lord of kings, that was all gone very quickly. The text goes on to talk about how King Nebuchadnezzar ordered all of the officials and wise men to bow before the statue. It was 90 feet tall. This 90 foot tall statue when the music plays. And if you do not bow down, you will be thrown into the fiery furnace. Of course, by God's grace and filled with his power and strength, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do not bow down. And this is our text. Let's read it together reverently. Daniel chapter 3, verses 13 through 27. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what god will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this manner. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, your majesty. He said, Look, I, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was the hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Here ends the reading. The wonderful old hymn asks the questions, Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Sometimes I wanted to stop the organ and the piano at that moment and say, yes, yes, there are so many trials, so many temptations. Perhaps you've thought the same. In looking at this text this morning, I don't want to create some kind of connection or illusion to being forced to do anything by a higher power or the government. That's not the purpose of this text. I also don't want to make these three wise men the point of the story. A human-focused reading can turn this into a trite phrase to be brave like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or have faith like these three men. But that's not the point of the main message of this text or, or scripture at all. God's word points us to Jesus in each and every story, in each and every line, and, and this text does that. And because this text does that, it gives us hope. Let's take a moment and think back just a year ago, back to January of 2020. 
there's not a single one of us that's watching this that foresaw the year that we would have. But the Lord knew. He was there and, and he's here today. His promises were true then. His promises are true now. Psalm 103 verse 5 says, The Lord satisfies our desires with good things. Psalm 139 16 that tells us that God gives us assurance that he knows every one of our days before even one of them comes to be. So none of the experiences that we had last year, none of the experiences we have this year are a surprise to our creator. In 2021, we will experience trials. In 2021, we will experience blessings far more than any of us will recognize or deserve. Even if the only blessing that we were to receive this year was forgiveness of sins, that would be enough. There will be many others and already have been that God allows and provides, but the Bible also reminds us that it's through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. Acts 14, 22. It's a part of life in this world that's corrupted by sin. Friends, we know this. We check the news on our phone or TV and, and we see it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced these fiery trials. Yet God was there with them and he is here with us. The trials we face in this coming year and throughout our lives might not could be as quite dramatic as faced by these three men in a foreign land so many years ago. And yet, we know for a fact trials will show up this year. I don't wish them on anyone. I don't want them myself. As a parent, there's hardly a greater desire in my heart and soul than that my kids will be safe and protected and not face difficult things. What parent, after all, wouldn't say if their child is going through something difficult? No, I would rather do that for them. At times, these worries and these fears and these trials can be a lot. They can even feel like they're too much to bear. They may even obscure our ability to see God's presence in our lives and to cause us to question him and wonder, what's your plan here, God? Are you even really there? God does not promise that there will be no trials in the lives of his people of faith, as some false theologies claim that we see. The Bible and the history of the Christian church attest to the fact that God's people will face an abundance of trials. We see it in the Old Testament with the stories of the Israelites. We see it in the New Testament. We see it in our history. Uh, even closer to home, we see it in our church's history. 1918, a little over 100 years ago in this area, many people died in this community from the flu. In the 40s, the 60s, 70s, young men were sent off to war many never to return. So many people were bankrupt in the 80s with the economic downturn. Things may be bleak in some ways now, but they've been bleak before. And it'll be that way until Christ returns. But throughout his word, God promises that even in the midst of trials, he will be there with us to strengthen us, to help us, and to bring us through. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were men of God with great wisdom and knowledge. Surely they knew of the promises of God spoken by the prophet Isaiah just about a hundred years before they faced their trial. Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. As I alluded to before, it's easy to look at these men and say what great faith they had, what power they had to trust. But the power that these men had is available to us today. I asked you before to grab your Bible and look at it. If we pick that up and hold that in our hands, that's the very word of God given to us. And the same word of God that came and gave that unbelievable power and strength and faith to these three young men is available to you today. So when you hold God's word in your hands, you hold God's message to you that he is with you in the midst of trials, that he will carry you through, and that ultimately, because of Jesus, all the troubles and trials and tribulations of this world would be but a blink of an eye compared to eternity with him. When those three men walked through the fire, which was so hot, it killed the soldiers that threw them in. They were not burned. King Nebuchadnezzar described the one who walked with them in there, the fourth man, as the son of the gods and as an angel later. 
Some great Bible teachers go back and forth about this. Some say it was an angel. Others say it was Jesus himself in there with them. Scripture doesn't say exactly, but it does tell us this simple truth, that God is with us in the midst of our fiery furnace, in the midst of our trials and temptations. He is there. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and 14 gives us a great promise of Scripture. The, the second word in, our, in that passage is a good one in the original language. It's often and correctly translated as temptations, but it also and equally so can be translated as trial. So listen to this promise in light of that. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No trial has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tested beyond your ability, but with the trial, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Friends, that verse points us to Jesus. It points us to the eternal and perfect life in heaven with him. It's not saying that you will escape these trials and these temptations on earth. It's saying that you will ultimately have peace from them in heaven because of Jesus. That verse reminds me of God's faithfulness to those three men long ago who faced their fiery trial in the furnace. But it also reminds me of God's enduring faithfulness to me and to you today and tomorrow as we face trials, whatever they may be. So friends, as we sit in our homes together this morning, separated by some distance, the same promise and grace given to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is given to us today through the word of God. Friend, you may have heard this message today for the first time, and you may realize how much you need Jesus. And perhaps you haven't thanked him for coming to you through his word, for creating faith in your heart. Perhaps today, for the first time ever, you see that you're a sinner in need of a savior. My friends, that's the Holy Spirit working in you. If you feel that conviction and that change of heart, God is coming to you and he is saying, I will give you faith. I will give you rest. My word has created faith in your heart to believe just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. And friend, we rejoice with you today if for the first time you realize that Jesus is Lord of your life. Maybe you're like me, someone who's heard this message before, hundreds, thousands of times. It's equally true for us that no matter what we face in life, we need Jesus. No matter what we face in life, our hope is not here of temporal things, of politicians. Our hope is not here for money. Our hope is not here in a country. Our hope, our peace, and our joy is found in nobody else other than Jesus Christ. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged take it to the Lord in prayer. Here's the gospel and the good news, my friends. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the faith given to Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and the same faith given to us by the proclamation of your word. Lord, today we rejoice that because of Jesus, we can know that our sins are forgiven, that because of Jesus, we can know that no matter what trials and struggles and troubles come our way, that your grace is with us and sufficient. So Lord, today we pray for those who have heard this message and maybe for the first time have a personal relationship with you. Lord, we rejoice with them. And we look forward to connecting with them as they grow in faith and understanding. And Lord, for the saints who have heard this message thousands of times, may it resonate new and true in our hearts that you are enough, that you are with us, 
and that you supply all of our needs in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace, my friends, and serve the Lord. Amen.